So I would like to welcome to stage the founder of Suggestic, Victor Chappella. Please welcome Victor to stage. Thank you. Thank you very much. Your slide oh, OK. So we came up with this really weird title for, for my talk uh, many months ago. I think it still stands, and it really talks to the very essence of what we're trying to build. But to make sense of it, I need to bring you back or walk you back to how the whole idea for Suggestic started. So we're talking about augmenting human decision making and how that can help eradicate chronic or most chronic diseases. So by going back, I, I started writing a book with a, a, one of my friends and colleagues about co causation and causality. And that book was never published, but that process of writing it for three years really gave us a lot of insight into many of the relationships between uh, the different strategies that evolution had taken and how these strategies could be used to understand the, the world. So here we found out that artificial intelligence uh, would come into a symbiosis with human intelligence, and that is basically what we started writing towards. Now, going back in time, if we realize that actually the whole universe tends to entropy, and the flip side of entropy is actually life. So on one side, that cube will tend to melt and dissolve and lose all its information and actually lose part of its energy. And life goes the reverse route. It tries to contain and maintain order throughout every single generation. So there's a few strategies that life has found to make, uh, to, per, uh, to continue to live on this earth and to avoid the risk of actually extinguishing. Uh, and ex the risk of extinction comes from the inability, so to speak, of life to adapt to the different uh, conditions. So one of the strategies life has to maintain or to, is to reproduce. And, and the reproduction actually allows it to adapt continuously to the environment. The environment used to be the world, then the world like meaning the oceans, eventually environment became other uh, species. Then the human uh, being came around and the environment now is a human being and whatever adapts to the human being survives and whatever doesn't uh, actually perishes. And I think that the next environment is the digital or the augmented uh, intelligence uh, where whoever, whichever species or the nature itself that can coexist with uh, artificial intelligence will have to adapt to this new world. Now, this continuous adaptation and has us trying to figure out what is the best way possible. And most of it is not rational. It's not a process in which most of us think. We, uh, even startups themselves, we all have very similar uh, companies with similar ideas, with similar business models. Some thrive, some don't, because of minor differences in, 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 the, in the timing of the company, and the team of the company, in the market where the company started. So this continuous adaptation has to find a way to adapt. And as we did, every single species in the world started encoding these strategies, those that worked, into their genes. And their genes were the, the encoding of what had worked for each animal, for each species more, more precisely. And those species that could adapt faster and would thrive and would survive. And these little experiments sometimes by chance would have a meaningful advantage uh, under given circumstances, and others would miserably fail, like most startups. So those things that don't work normally just get excluded from the gene pool. Now, those successful mutations actually become, and we haven't got rid of bacteria, they just evolve into the today, and those bacteria and every single animal and plants has evolved from these continuous mutations that have happened, all the way down to mammals, which are the most recent group of beings. And these mammals changed the way they would uh, mutate or adapt. Mammals are the only animals, except for some types of birds, that can actually learn tricks. 
uh, and learn through their experience in life. That's why every single animal in a zoo, from a killer whale to a mouse to a, an elephant, they are all mammals. Every one of them can learn different tricks. And us as humans uh, can also learn tricks and learn, uh, not tricks, uh, learn new strategies and adapt to our environment much faster than other animals. And that's why uh, mammals now do, uh, have a domination over uh, the ecosystem. And that has to do with two advances in mammals in general. One, as we all know, is the neocortex that allowed us to find causality. We could get something that was, uh, that we could figure out that this water tasted bad and we would stop going there, that this thing was bad for us, and, and it, it would combine it with emotions, which is also, uh, some people argue, also a mammal uh, process. So mammals developed emotions and the ability to find causality at the same time. And these two things uh, would allow us to find those things that we should do or not do, based if it feels bad and we can predict what's gonna happen, then we stop from doing that. So this prediction machine, which is our brain, actually allows us to figure out what are those things that we should be doing and those things that we should not. And that's how mammals actually came to be. And these things that we encode in our brains are basically it signals, uh, or more than that, their circuitry that connects based on things that either repeat themselves many times. So it, something that repeats itself many times gets myelinized. And this myelin makes that circuit um, prevalent over others. It allows it to, to be faster, and something that's faster in the brain inhibits every other uh, thing. So if we see something happening over and over again, like when training uh, or practicing violin, we will encode those things into our brain. And also another thing that encodes things is emotions. Uh, strong emotions encode things even if we haven't seen it many times. So we will have in our brain encoded those circuits that either made us feel very good or very bad, and those things that we've done many times over. So it's like a probabilistic machine, which actually confuses probability in, in terms of impact and probability. And, but those two things uh, together make up how we perceive the world and how we react to the world. So the human beings within this process of learning how to, uh, in the same way any other mammal would do, we learned something particularly uh, extraordinary. We learned to communicate these strategies. As opposed to most animals that have to relearn the process and learn it from direct experience, humans learned it from the experience of others. And as we developed, even though we've had the same gene pool for 200,000 years, it's only in the last 10,000 when we started writing and encoding that knowledge that it could spread out and it can start building on top of each other uh, generation after generation. This it became stories, and stories became our way of teaching our kids and our teaching other peoples in our society what was good and what was bad for us. Those things that were habits eventually became traditions, and those traditions became laws, and all of a sudden we had these encoded strategies for survival in all types of human endeavors. This collective wisdom allowed us to bring together and encode different strategies that had worked are not for human beings. And this, again, repeated over generations and generations. It, many different cultures had different things they would try, and if it worked, it was encoded as successful, and we would try it again. If it didn't work, it was encoded as, as a failure, and we would try to get people from doing it. And, and then we have uh, teenagers who are meant to change and, and try these things out again, just in case something has changed. And, and in a way, we find ways to complete, and startups, I would argue, are like the organization, the teenage organizations of the world that are trying to figure out which ways can work and which ways cannot. So once these things get encoded, they get transferred to new people. And as we transfer this information to new people, the other new people get it, and then other new people get it. And with the advent of the internet, this information and these strategies have been uh, can, uh, can be spread worldwide in just a few days. So as a culture, the human culture has never been as close as it is today. 
Uh, nevertheless, we have strategies that are different among countries. They're different among professions. They're different among companies, religions, families, and, and any social group we're in has its own set of rules. If you break the rules, you're expelled, you're put into jail, you are, uh, they stop speaking to you. Um, there's many ways each social group uh, kind of manages these rules. And the rules are trying to manage risk for that group itself. So every group has a set of rules, and these rules basically try to encode which are the successful strategies to, uh, so that everyone in that group can have a, a better, more successful uh, life. Uh, I would argue it's not exact. So the group wants, in the same way species that, um, would group up and have their same gene pool, I believe every single group of people where, where, we, are, uh, where we are part of have also a set of strategies that make that, stra uh, that group up. And those set of strategies as, as if we were subspecies within the world. So the problem here is that most of these subspecies had a set of thousands of years to build up what worked and what didn't. And in the last 100 years or 50 years, we've completely changed most of the social norms, most of the food we eat, most of the pollutants we, in here, we, uh, we digest or we breathe. And all of a sudden, all those memetics that we used to have do not work anymore. So from, from a evolutionary perspective, we were first evolving through hardware. Every new time we had a new, a new hardware, we could, we could have a new uh, chip uh, set and new rules. Then we started, when mammals came around, we started evolving through software. We could relearn and change our version number. And eventually, when humans came around, we learned to do it in a network style. So we've, uh, technology has also mimicked the way evolution has been uh, grow in its ability to, to, to share information or strategies. Now, the next stage in all this is machine intelligence. And what is it that machine intelligence really brings to the table? And it's the capability to find causation in much more complex information. So it, as human beings, we are very limited in which things we can learn from uh, causation. Normally, very simple causation. This uh, is, uh, if, We've seen every time this happens, this other thing is the result. And even though we, it's a very simple conversation, we still get it wrong because emotions, and there's a lot of people who really believe that if they watch the football in their bed, their team will win and things like that. Because that, it happened once, it happened twice, then that must be a causal relationship. Now, the interesting thing is, once we have many variables, and a very high number of those variables have uh, nonlinear relationships, our brains can no longer figure out the relationships. Uh, and so that's where machine intelligence can actually meet human intelligence in, in the symbiotic way. And given us those causal relationships that we can now use in much more complex uh, environments. And this is what really gave birth to Suggestic at the beginning, because we were, uh, haven't had other companies in the past uh, uh, artificial intelligence, where we were doing fraud prevention and things like that, it, we realized that that wasn't really helping anybody but some few executives at very large uh, corporations or, or banks. It, we wanted to do something that really impacted the life of many. And we thought that Suggestic could be that, be a way to uh, enhance the ability of people to make decisions by encoding all these rule sets that we did not have anymore. And out of all the places that we could find where we could add, actually add value, we realized that nutrition was one of the best places uh, that was a very complex problem. Uh, we, uh, we all have different diets from gluten and dairy-free to kosher to paleo to, to diabetes or heart disease. And we need to account for all these different ingredients and all these different things. And it's a hard problem. And every one of us is different. So, we started building this artificial intelligence nutrition coach, who's, and we had to account not only uh, 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 for the differences and similarities between human beings, but also in what our mind and our body were asking for. So 
we all know poor dietary choices have led to over half of the population here in California being diabetic or pre-diabetic. We know that 70% is overweight. And unfortunately, I, I lost my father to diabetes a, a few months ago. And he was a PhD. He was very smart. He was quite literally a rocket scientist. And nevertheless, he never quite understood how he could effectively change his diet to save his life. And I think that having those direct experiences, we've all had experiences like that, have attested to it's not about only telling people what they should eat. We all see a pie and, and uh, we know it's, it's not lack of willpower when, or probably it is, I don't know, but it's, we have this misconception that people with type two diabetes, people who are overweight lack willpower. And, and the reality is we, on the flip side, we have these idioms in English, like as easy as pie or piece of cake that attest to the fact that the easiest thing to do is to eat pie or cake. That's the easiest thing we can do. And that, that's not just because f physiologically we, 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 we want carbs and we want uh, fat. It's also because culturally, that is what we get when we behave, when it's our birthday, when we die. So cake is the, our way of celebrating it. So it's not only in our genetics, it's in our mimetics to actually eat pie and cake over and over again. So the decision-making process, going back to this whole idea, is very difficult for individuals when confronted with, uh, with food, especially if that problem. We know, all know biases in our life that we discount the future. So if we are told that we will die seven years younger, uh, and I remember one of the last times I, I had breakfast with my father, he was having some pancakes. He said, I, I said, father, you shouldn't have that. And he said, do you want me to die sad because I didn't eat my pancakes? So yeah, and actually it was so funny. I said, well, what the hell, you just eat. And a few months later he died. So he, he wasn't sad, that, that I know. It, and on the other hand, the decision-making process was fairly simple for him. He had tried every single diet he could many years ago. They didn't work for him. So he reverted to, I just want to be happy. It's, it's that easy. So I think that willpower is one of the least understood things in, in, in terms of, of human beings. There's this great book like uh, uh, Thinking Fast and Slow, which is a seminal book in relation to how our brain works. And every time we focus on something and we exert uh, um, and concentrate, our pupils dilate. Our brain goes into overdrive. We, we use a lot of their energy, and it's also exhausting. And willpower is actually depletable. And so people actually try not to think about things. My daughter recently had a second concussion in uh, playing soccer, and she hasn't been able to go to school for almost two months. And it was every time she tried to focus, she had a blinking headache because it was her uh, mitochondria within her neurons that had failed and they, they have to re, rehabilitate it, et cetera, and they have to rest. But concentrating makes your headache go worse because you get all this blood flow, you, your brain is trying to, to think about things. And this becomes very difficult when someone has to change a habit because it's the same willpower to stay on my diet that I need to use to think about staying on my diet. So the first thing I do is, they teach me what the diet is. And I read this book, super complex. I hate reading books. And then I'm confronted with a menu and I'm, oh my God. So now what is, the, what did they say? A high glycemic load, what, the, what is it? So you have to read one by one. It's a lot of effort. And so what if you could just have a kind of a red, yellow, green way of knowing what you could eat? And even more so, what if you could just have something choose for you the three best options at, in the menu at any given moment in time for you. And, and so behavioral science has proven that the best way to get people to change their diet or change behavior in general is constraining choice. So what we focused on is how can we help people constrain choice when at a restaurant, when at the groceries, when cooking at home? So if we can find a way to help people over and over and over, just give them the three good options, not have a list of everything they shouldn't. The three good options right now for you are these. 
that would be very useful. And if I, as a user, could be helped to choose a diet that was good for me, everything from the CDC diabetes prevention program to the uh, paleo diet, as this one, and then I would, could add that I'm gluten-free and dairy-free, or I could add that I hate uh, onions. And all those things could go into my phone and then start filtering out what can I cook for dinner. So what if I could just say I want a recipe right now? And based on the ingredients I already have in the fridge, it gives me three recipes I could cook. Now, what if I could just click on that and say, okay, you know what, I'm feeling lazy today. What can I have for lunch right now? And it gives me three restaurants. And out of those three restaurants, it gives me three top choices at each restaurant that I can eat. That is what we're building at Suggestic. And one more thing, what if it, we, we could make it even easier and we could allow you to point your phone at your menu and just have an overlay of what you can eat and what you cannot. That is awesome, I believe, because it completely takes away the pressure and the, and the requirement for you to think about what you need to do. And so basically, Suggestic is about helping at that choice moment filter out what is best for you. And only part of it, and partially, is, has to do with making it easy for the user. The other side of the equation is to make it, for, for it, ma making it as effective as possible. So in terms of effectiveness, we are starting by priming the system with evidence-based diets. We have 25 different diets that we have encoded into the system. Then we personalize it based on a user asking for, I want to help with my diabetes, um, or the, his uh, biometrics, we can even use the genetics. And so we define the diet for each person based on his goals and based on his, uh, the picture of his, uh, of his health. Then we start giving him recommendations on a daily basis over his, on his phone, which he can simply say, I, I, I will eat this, I won't eat this, or I actually chose something else from the menu and click on it. And by doing so, we get not only his passive feedback, which can come from all the sensors we've seen today and algorithms, but also his active feedback. This is what I just ate. Why? Because I clicked on it. And that goes into what we've called the multivariate causation engine, which is the real, the real uh, technology that we're building behind this. This is where the symbiosis actually makes sense. This allows us not only to figure out which types of people are uh, in which microbiome or which uh, a gene pool is, goes, increases or decreases your blood sugar levels in relation to bananas, but we are, can also have a sequence of those things that actually maintain your blood sugar levels in, in check and that have helped people like you maintain them in check and people like you actually what is the wrong things, which are the wrong things to do. And by having those paths of what makes you healthier and what doesn't make you healthier, we can continuously improve what we are uh, telling you to do. So who are we targeting this towards? And anyone on a special diet, in particular people with chronic diseases, that's over 70 million people in the US alone. Uh, what do we do? We do this easy nutrition coach uh, that, yeah, that you've just seen. And how do we do it? We've got over half a million restaurants already encoded, well, in our database. We have over a million recipes. We have, as I was saying, 25 encoded diets. We are working with healthcare uh, providers to do some clinical trials. And we're working with industry, uh, comp uh, some of them here today or were here today, some of them uh, outside. Um, and what we're doing is together finding a way to link all this information in a meaningful way. And so I think that this is what we're here for. This is why we were, uh, thank you, Lee, for bringing us together. So we can actually help link every single piece of information we have and bring it back to each individual that needs it. Um, I really, truly believe that it's, even though it's too late for my father, together we can still make it very easy for everyone else. Thank you. Martin and I, <laughs> we didn't, we're uh, randomly deciding who does what, so uh, I hope you enjoy the, 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 the chaos. That was a great talk, I much you. appreciate it. You've kindly left some time for Q&A. Uh, so let's uh, look across into these bright lights. I see Chris 
from Bose is dreaming off. I know you don't have a question. I just had to pick on you because right. it looked like you were daydreaming. Any questions? So this, OK, I'm, if nobody's got a question, I have to start firing in something. This causation engine, or is that what you called it? Yeah. Tell me about it, please. So the, the, that was initially what we were trying to build. Then in the process of, uh, and why we wanted to build it, we wanted to build a way to encode existing knowledge, like uh, existing evidence-based diets, and then have them refined by an AI that could learn what of those things actually work for me and for people like me. It's very similar to what we did with uh, fraud prevention. In fraud prevention, you had sub-milliseconds to decide if that transaction was yours or not, based on your previous behavior, based on your profile data, based on people like you, and based on uh, fraudsters' data. And, and by comparing that in real time using the same type of models we're using now, we could figure out if it was a legitimate transaction or not. And so taking that knowledge and applying it to, to nutrition and to health made a lot of sense because it's kind of the same problem. What is the sequence of events? What is my profile? And is this going to make me healthier or not? And what type of information we could add? Any type of information. We chose nutrition because it was where we could have a immediate impact in the world and where uh, people required most. Most of diabetes can be controlled or even reversed with the right, uh, with the right diet. And most of it can definitely be prevented. So I think that diabetes, uh, heart disease, uh, and in general, all chronic, disease, these, uh, uh, chronic diseases or uh, lifestyle diseases, as they call them as well, can be prevented with this type of uh, information. So now it's a matter of how you link that knowledge to and from everyone else here. Because I think that more than a conference where we're talking among peers mostly. So I think it's how can we bring together what we're all doing to make this a, a better world. That's definitely our mission and I think it's most of our mission here. And so I'm really happy to be here with all of you. If, no, we have time for s some more questions. I just wanted to follow on before a question from the audience. So if over half of California has diabetes or pre-diabetes, and half of California gets divorced, and relationships <laughs> affect your wellness as well as nutrition affects your wellness, can you apply Suggestic to the relationships to decide in your marriage partner? <laughs> uh, well, actually, that is something that has been studied more than nutrition, to be honest. There is a lot of engines trying to figure out who's good for you or not. And definitely it could be. And I think it's... Uh, um, I think the goal is different. It could certainly be done. It's uh, nutrition. I think it's slightly easier because there's a lot less. It's not a cultural uh, problem that you're trying to measure. It's food, and even though food is is a very hard problem in itself, it is quantifiable. Whereas emotions and and social interactions are far less quantifiable. So I think that we will first solve nutrition, and eventually we can get back to. Uh, helping people stay. Well, the other question is, do they want to air all of them stay? I know I well, do. Well, I just no, no, think no. that we make, human beings are very poor decision makers because of our evolutionary past. So we make choices that make us physically sick and we make bad social choices also. So, you know, you can reduce marriage down to mathematics. I, I, I saw it done. And so I cannot help but think our decision making will be augmented on the relationship side come time. I'm glad you're tackling food and in 10 years time, your phone will decide on who you couple up with. I, I, would, I, I would argue that from an evolutionary perspective, it's a better strategy to have people being unfaithful because you get a lot more uh, gene diversity. So uh, strictly speaking, that is, uh, from the evolutionary perspective, I think that is encoded into many of our behaviors. Uh, 
Yeah, it puts a new so. twist on what suggests it could actually be No, suggested. no, we're not. We're <laughs> exactly. You know where we're going. OK, uh, Rian. We won't be suggesting yes. anything about that. Uh, Thanks, Lee. Um, that. Victor, I'm a big fan of what you guys are doing and uh, the way you think about uh, these ecosystems and that we should collaborate. Obviously, it's very much in line with my own thinking. I much more uh, want to ask a lower level question now, and that is there's a lot of research papers that contrast fitness versus fatness. And always fitness is the, the thing that wins in these articles. It's always like you, all you need to do is exercise. But in my own individual case, um, nutrition was the, the, the domino that literally knocked on all the other dominoes. So um, how in your own work have you seen that to be the case? How do you contrast that with exercise and, and these things? And, and how do we get to the true e effect of food. Because, uh, my gut feel, and there's no pun intended there, but it's uh, my gut feel is that, that nutrition is very important, but I'm just thinking how we can, can more methodically open that up, understand that, and whether your data that you already possess can contrast the, the nutrition, not necessarily weight, but the nutrition element with the exercise elements. Yep. OK. so. So I think there's two very distinct problems. One is, I think exercise is certainly good, but it's not good in terms of losing weight. There's a correlation with higher weights and higher calorie, not even calorie, higher carb intake. And the high carb intake uh, is correlated with high blood glucose levels, which correlates with, well, actually, I would say causates. Uh, is causal in diabetes, heart disease, uh, even cancer. So, so I think that, that the reality is what we eat affects our health and our weight much more than how much we run. Uh, and there's a lot of uh, papers of, around how much you have to, like I think of French fries, you have to swim for two hours to just burn out uh, a, some French fries. So it's and it's not only the French fries in terms of carbs or blood sugar levels, it's also in terms of having the, blood, the wrong fat in your body, uh, which also generates oxidative stress and other, uh, and other problems. So from my perspective, I think diet would be 90% versus 10% exercise. Exercise is necessary, but in a small uh, percentage. Um, now on the flip side, I would say that the real problem for me and why we don't understand that better is because of the way the economy works and incentives work. Uh, food industry has an inverse incentive. People pay more for high carb food. Uh, and so the, the, you see the major advertisers in the US are generally food and not only food, they are uh, food with high levels of carbs in them, almost always, from sodas to, to dessert or to chocolate sweets. So, so you find that over and over again. People become addicted to that and, and eat more and pay more for, for something that is not nutritious and actually makes it harmful. So um, the, the food industry has wrong incentives, generally. And the healthcare industry is treated, as has been said over and over today, is treating disease and not prevention. So there's nobody with, and you cannot patent a lifestyle or a diet, and therefore there's no money to be made, but sell some books if you're, if you're fortunate. And, and people uh, are not really, really willing to pay for it yet. So I think that the real problem is on the one side, uh, we have a diversity of food that makes it very difficult for our cultural memes to actually help us out, navigate those, those, th those new foods that didn't even exist when our parents were young. And on the other hand, we have industries, entire industries, that profit from the existing establishment that can misinform and have been misinforming everyone. Uh, and, and they tend to react every... So, I've seen reports where sugar is worse than cigarette in terms of cancer and, and many other things. And obviously, that, that we're not suing uh, the sugar industry yet. 
I do apologize for the two people who were going to ask questions, but we're out of time. Yeah, no, no worries. Thank you. We can, we can remain. We'll be here around. Thank you, everyone.